If you want to turn to John chapter 4, we have quite a largish text to cover this morning, but I think I'm going to be doing this in two parts. We'll we'll read all of it so we have the context and then uh, talk about the first half. While you're turning, I just want to make mention recently the magazine Christianity Today had an article on racism and the recent unpleasantness in our country, which, <laughs> take your pick, whether it's the shootings last week, and that's really what he was talking about, or the, uh, the incessant conflict that seems to be purposefully fomented. Let's keep everybody on edge and freaking out, right? The author made some good points, but then he diverged on some areas that were not so good. He said this, pastors in particular have to ask, how do we use the pulpit to preach against racism? Okay, it's a fair question. I would say in the exact same way we would use the pulpit to preach against anything that is sinful. I mean, how many of us in this room today believe that racism is just a neutral thing? It's no big deal. Well, of course, no one thinks that. And he said again, first I would ask clergy to do a rough audit of their sermons over the last few years and ask themselves how often they've discussed this issue in depth. See, there's where I disagree. That's a problem because trying to force a topic into a text means that now you're, you're reading your own thoughts into the text. It's called eisegesis. Remember back in, in John chapter 1 where Jesus exegeted the Father. He explained the Father. That's what we're to be about. What does the text specifically say and draw out our thoughts from the text rather than the other? He then added that during the announcements, a pastor can acknowledge the racism that motivated the border city shooting. He's talking about El Paso. Okay, or I guess by the same token, a pastor can acknowledge in the announcements the leftward and satanic allegiance of the Dayton shooter. I mean, right? It's all fair game, equal weights and measures. See, this is only true if it's appropriate to the proclamation of Christ's lordship. We can see all kinds of connections going both ways. I mean, <laughs> But it's always down to one thing. It's always the evil in men's hearts, right? I mean, let's face it. A gun didn't get up that morning and decide by itself that it was going to go on a rampage. No, it was some man used a tool to fulfill his wicked, evil, revengeful, and frustrated desires on innocent people. Well, on people. No one's innocent. But you know what I mean. They didn't commit any crime. And there's nothing wrong with preaching something that's timely, right? If something happens in your community and, okay, we're going to address it. But see, the passage that we're looking at today has actually been used as a jumping off point to pe preach about racism or sexism or even ethnic pride. Now, to be sure, race and sex and pride are all part of this narrative, but that's not the point of the passage. Remember, the, the point of the sermon should be the point of the passage and vice versa. It's a long passage. I think we can glean the main area of application. I'm going to be concentrating on verses 1 through 14 this morning, but I want to read the whole thing so we get the context. So we're reading from the New American Standard, which, by the way, I wish that Spurgeon Bible was in the New American Standard. <laughs> then I'd be spending some money. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting this thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, and there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. 
Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, then, do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have, true, you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, him that is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Only John records this narrative. It's not found in the synoptics. Again, each author, as carried along by the Spirit, is writing exactly what God wants to be written. And Jesus is on his way to Galilee, which is where most of his ministry takes place. And it's because his time has not yet come, that is, for Jesus to be delivered into the hands of the Pharisees and the Romans and be crucified. He gets wind of the fact that the Pharisees know that his ministry is growing and John the Baptist's is diminishing. And of course, they're already plotting and scheming. And so he leaves Jerusalem to go to Galilee. All of the events were to be at the right time. He wasn't just going to be taken at any time during his earthly ministry and crucified. Remember, he, a couple of times in John, he says, my time is not yet come. And then when it did come, he said, now I must go to Jerusalem, now to fulfill everything that I've come to do. And Jesus isn't looking for a confrontation with him, not yet anyway. Now, there's been so much written about the background of this Jewish and Samaritan conflict and the tension that arises that it could take, it'd take a series of lectures to cover. I'm just going to cover it in a basic overview Samaria was the land north of Judah, north of Jerusalem, located between Judah and Galilee. Galilee, there were a lot of uh, Hellenistic Jews. That's where the Decapolis or the, the Ten Cities is. I'm kind of doing the map so you see it. Here's Jerusalem, Samaria, and over here's the Decapolis. There's the Sea of Galilee and all those regions there. We, we could be high tech with a PowerPoint, I guess. Oh, that's so passe. It was what was left of the old northern kingdom. If you remember back in 1 Kings, the house of Israel was divided into Judah with two tribes, and then the remaining ten tribes were the northern kingdom. It's prophesied by Nathan when he said to David, you are the man. And from this day forth, there's going to be division in your household. And it all... It took place not only in David's household, but in his extended household. 
So in about 720 BC, the Assyrians captured the northern kingdom and they take most of the people away captive. Now, if you're going to conquer a land, you have to think in militaristic terms, right? So if the Assyrians kept everybody in the northern kingdom, would you think all those people want to be subjects to Assyria? Well, of course not. So it would take a lot of soldiers, a lot of policing to keep things, keep the lid on the pot. And what they do, it's easier just to take the people out and move your own people in. And that's exactly what they did. They brought in their old culture, their own religion, and they intermarried with the existing Jews. So by the time Nehemiah is rebuilding Jerusalem in 444 BC, after the southern kingdom came back from their Babylonian captivity, Wow, this is, talk about an Old Testament survey. We're just blitzing through all this history. The Samaritans are already seen by that time as being covenantally compromised. They're impure. They're unclean. Remember, the Samaritans offer to help, and they say, no, we don't want your help. And then they actively oppose the rebuilding. So it's just bitterness for 400 years is going on. And this is why most serious Jews would not go through Samaria. It would make you unclean to be in that area. So to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, you would go either the long way around or the long way around, not the shortest route straight through Samaria. Samaritans believed that their worship, which is based on a Samaritan Pentateuch, they had the, the, the Torah, but they didn't have the rest, was the true religion of the ancient Israelites from before the Babylonian captivity, preserved by those who remained in the land of Israel, as opposed to Judaism, which was the religion of the house of Judah. And we'll come to that next week when we consider what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. And it says in verse 4 that he had to pass through Samaria. Sure, he could have gone around like everyone else. But the text says he had to pass through Samaria. Why? Well, we're not sure 100%, but I think all things being equal, Jesus was always talking about whatever he does is what he sees the Father do. Remember, after his baptism, what was the first thing that happened to him? He was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and then tempted by the devil. Jesus, as we said last week, had an unlimited supply of the Spirit. He's not like the other prophets who would have some of the Spirit, like a drain that's dripping water. He had full and uninterrupted access to the Spirit of God. Verse 5, so he came to a city. Now, let me pause for a second. In the New American Standard, you'll see a little asterisk by the word came. And what that means is in the Greek, it's, a, it's a, like an ongoing present tense. Kind of like a guy's telling you a story. He says, so this fella comes over? Instead of, so this fella came over. When he says that fella comes over, it makes it like you're more engaged in the story. Oh, yeah, he, tell me more, doc, you know. So every time it says came, it literally means so he comes in. It's like a, like a current narrative. Verse 5, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sitting thus by the well, in the sixth hour, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. By the way, it wasn't like, why don't you just go grab us some lunch and we'll meet back here in an hour. Well, we would go to McDonald's or easy, a couple bags. We'd come back with bags of food and why did you get mustard on my sandwich? No, they, they had to bargain at the marketplace and it wasn't as easy to do. So it's about noon, that's the sixth hour. It's a hot day and Jesus is just worn out. He's tuckered, he's tired, wearied. And he's thirsty. Jesus in his incarnation is just like us. He doesn't use his miracle working power for his own benefit. In fact, try to find anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus uses his own miracle working benefit for anyone other than 
others. That's key. Years ago, my good friend Vern Egley, to be Christ-centered is to be other-centered. Exactly. This is what Jesus did. He used his, his proclivities to work miracles for the benefit of other people and for the glory of God, his, God the Father. So this woman approaches. Now, Jacob's well is situated far enough away from the city where you could see someone coming a long ways away. It wasn't like in the city. It's outside. And so he sees this woman approaching, carrying her water jar. We know she had a large receptacle because in, in verse 28, it says she left her water jar. And Jesus initiates the conversation. He, he starts it all. He makes the first move, and we could say he's making the first move, initiating evangelizing, not to the house of Israel, but to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. He's starting this right now. He says, give me a drink. It's not an unreasonable response. Not, a, not an unreasonable question, I mean. But her response is interesting. And, and we don't get this from our vantage point. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? How did she know he was a Jew? First of all, he could have been from anywhere. You know, it's kind of like they look very similar, probably darker skinned, Semitic features. It's the Far East, you know. He probably had tassels on his robe. He was a teacher. Remember, they called him Pharisee, master. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been inappropriate for Jesus to have the kind of dress that would mark someone as being, oh, you're, you're an ethnic Jew. Okay. And John gives a little editorial comment here that explains her response. Remember the end of verse 9, it says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. It's literally, literally it means Jews don't use the same. It's really a slam on the Samaritans. It's like they don't use the same utensils. They don't use the same water pots. They don't use the same roads. You have nothing to do with these people. Remember back in, in John 3, we talked about the world sometimes being represented as the Jewish world and the Gentile world. Well, this is, this is almost worse in a, in a sense. That was definitely part of the thought. And, you know, when you read Romans uh, 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that all is really contextually about Jews and Gentiles both having sinned. Let me read a quote from uh, a rabbi who explains the, and I believe this was a, a rabbi who became a Christian later, Jews, quote, looked upon them, looked upon the Samaritans as having no part in the resurrection. What did we just read in our catechism? Even, even the wicked are raised for judgment. The Jews saw the Samaritans. They, they don't have anything to do with the resurrection. They're excommunicated and cursed them by the sacred name of God, by the glorious writing of the tables and by the curse of the upper and lower house of judgment with this law, that no Israelite eat of anything that is Samaritans, for it would be the same as eating swine's flesh. Now that's, that's bad. When I say Samaritan, the next word that pops in your head is usually good. We're thinking of the good Samaritan. And that was really, that, that parable is not intended to teach us to be nice to others. That was a judgment on the Jews. In this case, Samaritans felt the same way about the Jews. They're separated primarily because somewhere, someone broke covenant with God and thinks they're still in the covenant. That's really it. Someone close to you has betrayed a fundamental trust that you used to hold in common. Now think with me, which... Which religious groups would we spend the most time having apologetic debates with? It wouldn't necessarily be Buddhists, right? Because they, first of all, I don't know many. Second of all, their worldview is completely 
separated from, from ours. It's irrational, and they revel in their irrationality. All is one, and one is all, and there's no differentiation. And uh, No. <clears throat> we see it today with the Sunni and Shia conflicts in the Middle East. We go, what are they fighting over? They're both Muslims. They both do this. They both look alike. They both wear the same robes. They both say the prayers. They both have that weird thing, you know, from the minaret. No, but they hate each other. And most of the violence in the Middle East is between these two groups. <laughs> we're, just, we're just going, what? Can't, you, can't we all just get along? What about this? Roman Catholic versus Protestant. Oh, that's right. What's wrong with these people? They're all Christians. They believe in the Trinity. They actually are Trinitarians. Christian versus, pick one, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, whatever flavor of weird Jewish roots or anti-Trinitarian sect. I mean, that's really, it's, it's, it's almost like you were brothers and now you're not. In the world's eyes, you're practically the same. And this goes for the Jewish versus Samaritan issue in the eyes of the Romans. In fact, there was, there was such a conflict that one of the Roman generals over there just went in and crucified everybody. I mean, it was like, that's it. I've had it up to your room. Well, <laughs> And to make matters worse for the woman, she was somewhat of an outcast in her own community, a social pariah, we would say. She's not a good woman, but she was an adulteress. She's been through five husbands and is now fornicating with number six. She's not married to him. Now, whether some or all or none of her previous husbands died, it doesn't say. We do know, though, that for a woman to come alone to the well at noon is not normal. During biblical times, drawing water and chatting with your friends at the well, social high point of a woman's day. You want to come early where it's before it gets too hot, where the water's still relatively cold. However, this woman was ostracized and marked as immoral, an unmarried woman living in open sin with a man. She's the opposite of Nicodemus. Remember John 3, Jesus explains all this to him using, we would say, earthly metaphors for spiritual realities. Remember, Nicodemus was erudite and learned and very moral. He kept Torah. But here she's an openly immoral Samaritan woman. And Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, so this, this well, Jacob's well, was kind of unusual. It had running, running water underground. But in the vernacular, living water usually means a stream or a river. Back in chapter 3, Jesus compared the Spirit with water and with wind in being born from above. And here he does something similar, uses an earthly image to communicate a heavenly reality. Living water has a double meaning. And of course, we have the perspective of 2,000 years later, we get it right away, but she doesn't yet. And Jesus uses this word here, gift. If you knew the gift of God, this encompasses a whole lot of giving from, from God's perspective. Paul uses the same word to describe the free nature of justification by grace alone through faith alone. Romans 3.23, I mentioned it before, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Next verse, one of my favorite, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. I like, I like the King James. Being justified freely by his grace. Praise God. If you only knew the magnitude of the gift, the ultimate gift of grace. Lady, this is, 
This is infinite mercy. This is grace. This is disdeserved. You, you deserve the opposite, and yet God is right in front of you, offering you grace. Mercy that is unearned and gratuitous. Here the woman is just going about her business, trying to avoid the crowds, openly and sinfully living with a man. And let's get real, okay? <clears throat> a woman like this has probably been used and abused. And she, in turn, then becomes a user and abuser. Now, I'm not married again. I'm not marrying ever. I've been burned once, twice. We've all seen this type of woman. They're, they're, they come up, they kind of come off proud and almost brazen. A little jut on that lower jaw. You know, the mouth downturned. With all the protective armor of her toughness and her attitude, not allowing any, anybody into that shell. And the enemy wants nothing more than to keep her there. Better just leave that kind of person alone. They're, they're just too far gone. Listen, I'm, I'm making stereotypes here because stereotypes are usually useful because they're true. Generalities are useful simply because they're characteristics that we all observe. All Cretans are lazy gluttons, evil brutes. We all know this kind of woman. Now, we don't know her background for sure, but Jesus does. He says, if you knew who it is who says to you, give me a drink. Jesus already knows who he is in himself. Jesus has already inaugurated his public ministry as the Messiah. And he's reaching out, as it were, to what everyone else would consider the scum of the earth, the lowest, Samaritan woman. And even within her own people, she's lower class. Yeah, you don't worry about her. At least in the world's estimation, she, she is. And he knows that this living water is life itself. One of John's ways of speaking or in these euphemisms, to drink. We'll see it later on in John 6 and then John 7. And he uses all of these wonderful ways of saying the same thing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Nothing can compare. So put yourself in her shoes for, for a second. Maybe she's just genuinely confused. You just asked me for a drink and now you offer me water? How does this, I don't get it. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw wealth with and the well is deep. So where do you get that living water? Maybe she's genuinely confused. I don't know. I, I remember Nicodemus's response. He, he had a little bit of sarcasm when Jesus said, you have to be born from above. Remember, it's a ridiculous statement. Well, how can a man... Crawl inside his mother's womb again, you know. And her attitude comes off a little too. She sounds, as the British would say, a little off-put. Verse 12, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and cattle? See, the, what, what's she saying? Our father Jacob, not yours, she doesn't use the us to mean you and I. She means us Samaritans. There's probably a little bit of indignation. Remember, who are you, a Jew, to talk to me? By the way, it's our father, Jacob. He gave us the well. It comes off later in her, in her talk about worship. You know, you people. Jesus answered and says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become a well in him of water springing up to eternal life. Now we read this and it sounds pretty straightforward. But the woman, to, to her, this is, this is just far out, far-fetched. Jesus is still thirsty after walking probably six, six hours, hot, dusty, and fatigued as he is. We could understand if he got his drink first and then started talking, but it doesn't say that. 
His priority is her and to give life and abundant life too. That's the kind of language springing up to eternal life. Just this vision of a fountain just full of water in the, in the Far East. It's not like, you know, I can take my cup, I get a little thirsty, I'll walk out there, hit the button. Oh, wait, do I want real cold water or just cool water? So handy. We can turn the faucet on. These people have to draw, for, pull, work. We're going to see that later in John 6. Draw. It's not like, here, here water. No, you got to work. You have to exert to pull water. Big old clay water pot full of water. That's work. But here Jesus is saying, no, it's not work. It's free. It's a gift. It's a great example of John the, John the Apostle gives us a sense of how Jesus uses these common earthly things as springboards for spiritual truths and for evangelism, the gospel for all. See, her greatest need isn't water or a water pump or maybe a cart to pull the water jar back into town or even her greatest need isn't even a husband. Her greatest need is to be forgiven and to be cleansed and to partake in the life of God through Jesus Christ. See, we're so, we're so transfixed by the, by the temporary fixes, right? Do this for a better you, 10 steps to a healthy marriage. and Okay, maybe it's helpful sometimes. You walk six hours, you get tired, you sit down, have a drink, you're going to get thirsty again. It's going to happen. But drink of the waters of eternal life, the life of God, nothing else will satisfy. Nothing can come close. I, I always marvel when someone who maybe was a Christian celebrity and, and then later on says, you know, I no longer can call myself by any diff. just happened, Josh Harris. Remember, the, I kissed dating goodbye. Well, it sounds like he kissed Christianity goodbye, too. And I can't imagine how you would go from, therefore, being justified by his grace, you have peace with God, to anything else. What can compare? So Jesus here at this announcement stage, the first stage, saying that he is the only source of this life. We're probably not going to get to stage two this morning where he deals with her sin. I just want to ask us this it, 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 as we close this morning. Are you, are you willing to reach out to the adulterous Samaritan woman in your neighborhood? I'm sure you can think of somebody. Take two seconds and go, okay, who do I think is kind of lower class, and I really don't want to mess with them. Oh, I just thought of three. <laughs> I run into them at the parking lot in town. I don't, I don't recognize them because, well, they've, they've been used and abused. They've abused and used. I used to ride the school bus. They're three years younger than me. They look like my grandpa. They've just aged horribly. They don't even roll their windows down when they smoke cigarettes in the car. I don't get it. But really? I don't get that? Of course I do. It's, again, it's, it's a lifetime of sin. This woman, lifetime of sin. Five husbands, now fornicating. Doesn't matter to Christ. Remember, it's, it's not the far goneness of the person. It's the power of God. The wind blows where it wills. Remember, our, our greatest need is not more money or a husband or a wife or the right career. Our greatest need is to, to live in harmony with God's revealed will, his law, and to apply that wisdom that comes from above. But it always begins with, if you knew the gift of God and he who it is who asks you for a drink, you wouldn't be bothered by anything else in the whole world. No amount of money can 
can pay for this. You can't work your way into goodness and you can't find the solution anywhere else. It's utterly unique. And all begins with the living water of the spirit that only Christ can give. That's this woman's greatest need. That's everyone's greatest need. If the greatest problem is sin and separation from God, then the greatest need is Jesus Christ. But the greatest solution is Jesus Christ. That's it. Amen, indeed. Be ready to offer the living water to those who may kind of gross you out a little bit. Remember, you gross somebody else out at one time too. Let me just repeat. It's not about how far gone someone is. It's about the power of God. I believe in irresistible grace. The eye in the tulip. I, there's no power in heaven and on earth that can stop the Spirit of God from regenerating whoever he wants to regenerate. Amen. That person's own past, their willful rebellion at that time, it's called regeneration. And here Jesus is saying, if you knew him who offered you this water, you would take it. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you didn't consider us beyond hope, whether we were wickedly rebellious or wickedly self-righteous. You condescended and reached out and gave us that living water. Lord, help us to remember this example of Christ as we go about our busy days. Help us, Lord, to never forget where we came from and even more importantly, to never forget who you are and the power of God unto salvation. We give you all the glory and thank you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.